speaker is Jonathan Aesop. Uh, he's going to talk to talk about uh, jQuery Mobile and how to build uh, scalable and maintainable applications. So, Jonathan. Hey. Um, so, my name is Jonathan Azoff. I'm from San Francisco, California. Um, I guess you could say I'm somewhat of a JavaScript hobbyist. Um, I work as an application engineer, but I do JavaScript for fun. Uh, a lot of open source stuff. Um, specifically, when it has to do with jQuery. I, I think jQuery is really fun to work in. Um, I've been doing it for a while. I know it's kind of tongue-in-cheek, but uh, it's really fun for me. So um, Today, I, I am going to talk to you about building a jQuery mobile app, so don't let the title scare you. Um, <laughs> but before you get all worked up about it, um, let's, let's talk about it a little. Um, see, I needed to build a jQuery mobile app so that I could talk about it. Um, <laughs> And I needed a presentation, so um, <laughs> I created a jQuery mobile app. Um, it, it's also this presentation, um, which is about a framework that I used to build this presentation. Uh, just mind blown, I know. Um, so why should uh, why should we care about it? Like, well, before I gallivant into the code that I wrote for. Um, let's consider what makes a mobile presentation compelling. Uh, mobile presentations seem like a cool twist on uh, presentations in general. Um, if you are to believe stat counters, mobile uh, kind of <laughs> aggregates or their graphs, then you'll know that, that there's a pretty sizable chunk of mobile out there. Um, my little graphics getting cut off, sorry. Um, and uh, jQuery, if you believe jQuery mobile type, then you're going to be able to support uh, 28 or more of them. Um, that's work I'm happy not to do. Uh, and it seems to work fine on my mobile devices, even though I'm kind of an Apple fanboy. Um, but I've tested it on some other Android devices, and it seems to be running all right. Oh, and BlackBerry, uh, but I haven't seen any of those here. so. <laughs> Um, okay. Um, in addition, you can totally take advantage of jQuery Mobile's UI toolkit if you use Tassion. Um, so I made a little demo. Uh, I really like Mega Man. Uh, it's probably like my favorite video game of all time. So I just I used like two controls, just a button and a slider, to show you that like you can actually you know have interactive presentations. I don't know. Maybe if you're talking about sprites, that's a sprite. Um, so the other cool thing that I really thought, you know, you could take advantage of if you were so inclined, is the fact that um, you can act, uh, or rather, you can uh, you can style your presentations. Um, there's uh, five predefined swatches in jQuery Mobile. Um, they're pretty basic. I'm using the black one. I think it's the default swatch. Um, I'm also not the most artistic person, so it's nice to have someone do that for me. Um, what's cool, too, is if you're less inclined or lazy, you can, or rather, if you're not lazy, you can go and make your own totally awesome style sheet. Uh, I made one for you guys. Um, that might be cool. I, I don't know, you know how inclined you are, but I did this using uh, jQuery as a tool called jQuery Mobile Theme Roller. Um, Non-developers can go and literally make themes for their presentations. So it's compelling, not just a developer would be the only one who could use this. Uh, okay. Um, so last but not least, you can take advantage of the fact that nobody really pays attention to presentations anymore. Um, like, I mean, I, I'm a subject to this too. I'll, I'll look at my Twitter stream or uh, I actually <laughs> have this phone. It's a really crappy phone, but I got it uh, for Madrid. I look at it sometimes, too. Um, it happens. Um, but you can engage your audience in a different way. Um, so I'd like to invite you guys to join me in this presentation. Um, you can opt to either uh, just go to that link, or uh, if you have a QR code, you can, uh, or a QR code scanner, you can navigate to it directly. Um, it's uh, azof.fr slash Spain underscore JS. Um, 
when you connect, you may notice that the WebSocket takes a moment to connect you. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and connect on my phone um, so that I can connect as well and give you guys enough time to do it. So give you a moment and move to the next slide. And I may need to uh, reload to get my socket running. <laughs> oh yeah, one unintended side effect is that everyone on the Wi-Fi is probably going to be really slow. <laughs> okay. Um, let me see here. Okay. So just saw my server sent a message out. So if you're following along, it may, the latency is about 200 some milliseconds is what I saw personally. Um, hopefully yours will not be that bad. Okay. Uh, so what's gonna happen when you connect is you're, you're basically, um, you're connecting to what, what I called like a sync channel. Um, it, it's, uh, it's just a, mechanism for two-way communication. Um, and uh, I'm actually not doing a lot of that work. I'll talk more about it later. But um, uh, it, it, one thing you may notice is that you can't actually control the presentation when it's in sync mode. Um, that's because I should be controlling it. Uh, but you can shut it off if you want to go read the rest of my slides and go party after. <laughs> but uh, it's possible if you want to do it. Um, not all devices support syncing. You'll figure it out pretty quickly if yours doesn't. Um, I know on Android, you might need to use uh, the, Fire, the new Firefox browser. Um, and I think uh, Safari on iOS 5 and above will support it. Um, I have a little asterisk there. So if you look at my slide and click it, you can see the uh, can I use uh, information about it. Um, cool. So now let's jump into the code a little bit. Uh, you should all be joined in and uh, I'm going to have to scroll around a little to talk about it. So um, first and foremost, I, I'm using YepNope, which um, is a, it's an asset JavaScript loader. Um, it's used in Modernizer. It's made by um, Alex Sexton and um, Raph Holtzman. Uh, I'm using it in particular because it can load CSS, um, which is going to be important for Tassion later. Um, one thing to note right now is we're going to be talking about Tassion top-down so that you can understand what went through my mind building a jQuery mobile app. Um, so this is literally the top, is the including of jQuery mobile. Here you can see I'm loading the CSS and JavaScript for jQuery mobile. Um, I'm loading this library here, which I'll talk about later for syncing. Um, and I'll load uh, Tassion's client files. So I have a small CSS and a small JavaScript file. The CSS file is optional if you don't want to include it, um, but uh, it, it'll give you some features which I can talk about. Um, and then finally, uh, I called my entry point start. Um, and uh, so let's talk a little bit more about what that looks like. Okay. Um, so we're going we're gonna to move top down, like I said, and talk about, talk about the entry point of Tassion. Um, like any good jQuery author, um, we should wait for the DOM to be ready before doing anything. Um, jQuery Mobile has suggestions that you wait for these other magic events that they made. Um, I don't really listen to a lot of the jQuery Mobile events, so I just really just care that the document's ready. But um, in the same vein of not blocking unnecessarily. Um, I also want to load definitions from, from uh, the uh, person creating the slides. Um, and I don't need to wait for the DOM to be ready for that. So I have some pretty intense jQuery code here. Um, so I'll talk about it. Uh, in the beginning, I, I just created a deferred object, which uh, I'm using to wait for the um, end of the loading cycle. Um, I'm doing a lot of caching here. Uh, on mobile, caching aggressively is always a win. Um, and I make no exception here. Um, and I resolve the uh, document ready deferred when document is actually ready. Um, I also capture some other elements I know I'll need. 
Um, and then down here, I do a similar type thing where um, I create a deferred object inside of this load file function um, and uh, you know, pass in a manifest file, which the user will provide. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a second. So the last portion right here is basically when the manifest is loaded and the document is ready, um, I'll be able to execute the initialization of Tassion. Um, that's uh, really important to, for me to, to build it out like this because I will guarantee the optimal start time of the application because I'm not unnecessarily waiting for the document to be ready or the manifest to be loaded before I execute my code. I know I execute it at the exact point they're both ready. Okay. So, what is a manifest? Um, I spent a lot of time thinking about what actually needs to go in this file, and I know manifest is an overused kind of term, uh, so I apologize for those of you who are angered by the fact that I used it, um, but it is what it is. So, um, it seems obvious that if I'm opting to send messages to the audience's devices, I might need to define like some type of server. Uh, my server's running on my computer, so you guys can't, unless you're on my network, talk to my computer and send messages to everyone else, which is good. Um, I also probably need an API key so that I can um, ensure that it's actually the correct server that I'm talking to. Um, and then finally, there, when you think about slides, there's probably things that are the same about some slides and there are things that are different. Um, I decided to separate those out, so a template file and a list of slides seemed obvious, um, especially considering that on, uh, it, or rather, <laughs> in the case of uh, the browser, it can't read the server's file system, so I need to provide an actual list of files. Um, that seems like a pretty fair list of things to request, so I left it there and it seemed good enough. Um, okay, so now that we have our input, what are we going to do with it? Um, well, once again, we should probably cache what we can about the presentation at this point. Every moment we can cache something, aggressively cache it. I, I don't want to use jQuery or anything where I don't have to. Um, so you can see here I have a global presentation object and I'm caching the slides. Uh, I'm also caching how many slides I have. Um, I'll attempt to open a socket. Uh, once again, I'm, I'm going to talk about this much later in the presentation because it's a whole longer topic. Um, so I apologize, I'm going to skip over that part for now. Um, and then the last part is just getting the template file. So um, it, in the case that a user didn't define a template, I'll define one for him. Um, and later on, I'll talk about the anatomy of a template and what, what actually needs to be in there. As it turns out, that happens to be the lowest common denominator. Um, but uh, after I load the template, whether you define it or not, I will then bootstrap. So what's bootstrap? Um, Bootstrap is a term I'm just using loosely. It could mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. Um, but really, this is my bootstrap. It's a three-line beauty that is basically putting Tassion in between the user and jQuery mobile. Um, you, if, if maybe you were here yesterday, you probably heard a lot of gripes about frameworks and jQuery mobile and stuff. I actually agree with a lot of it. Um, but the fact is there's a lot of good work in there too and I, I want to be able to use it, but I want to use it in a way that works with my workflow. So uh, let's talk a little bit about what I'm doing here. Um, I'm going to parse the location. All that function is doing there is, is taking the current URL and figuring out what the slide and the step is. You can see from here, I just have a pretty simple um, syntax for my format string. It's, it just mirrors a query string. Um, I'm also going to intercept the page before change uh, event that jQuery mobile fires. This is probably the most important part of the entire, um, I guess, bootstrapping process. I, this, is, this is the only way you can stop jQuery mobile from doing its thing. Um, so that's an important line. And then the last one is I just force um, jQuery mobile to change to whatever page is defined in the URL. I default to the first if none is defined. So that's, that's all Bootstrap is doing. But uh, the real compelling stuff actually happens in the onChange function. So let's talk about that. Um, so I, I call this part subverting jQuery mobile. Um, 
like I said, it, it, it can be tremendously useful, uh, especially if you're running in a serverless environment like I am. I'm running off a of CDN on GitHub, and I'm running my socket server locally. I'm not paying for anything, so it's great. Um, but you can't really do that normally with jQuery mobile because it's supposed to run off a of server. So this is going to be the part that helps us avoid that. Um, so once again, I'm going to grab the location. Uh, when jQuery mobile calls this event handler, it's going to pass in a, a jQuery event, and it's also going to pass in a data object. The data object has information about what type of transition we should make, things that are important to jQuery mobile. To us, the only thing we really care about right now is where it wants to go. So um, <laughs> what I'm going to do here is actually check if it's a URL. And the reason for that is, and this is quite unfortunate, but the suggested way by, at least last time I read the jQuery mobile docs, of subverting their default controller is literally grabbing the location, doing whatever you need to, and then recalling the event handler with a location that is not a string. So I'll talk a little bit about how I do that. But for now, suffice to say, I check to see if the URL is a string. Once again, parse the location state out of it. And then I call the update method. And that's where I'll be generating the content for every slide. Um, finally. Um, and from our last talk, talked about event prevent default. It is really useful here, too. This is actually what's going to stop jQuery mobile from doing anything like changing your page. So at this point, you can imagine the user is at a state where he has changed the page, however, whether through his own navigation or through the URL. Um, and jQuery mobile has intercepted that event. We have intercepted jQuery mobile's handler and we prevent it from doing anything and start generating our own content. So it, it's going to be on us to, to run this code again and let it execute its default behavior with our content. OK. Um, so the next major piece is how we should generate slide content um, and then re-trigger that page before change event. Um, I opted to use a few abstractions to do this for the sake of simplicity. This is one of the longer functions, um, so I just want to make sure that it can fit in the screen. Um, and I didn't happen to use CoffeeScript, so <laughs> it's, it's just JavaScript. Um, the first thing I want to do is inform the user. This is kind of like what's been mentioned a couple times in these past couple of days. Um, the, you know, just showing some type of notification. All that is is just a light wrapper over jQuery mobile's spinner function. So, uh, you know, for now, we'll ignore it. But uh, options here just takes the slide and the options passed in from the original event and ensures that if you're going to like another slide that's backwards, you're actually moving in the reverse transition, things like that. It's um, n not really in line with just the basic workflow. So I'm, I'm going to abstract that away as well. Um, get slide, kind of a similar type thing. It's just going to grab the template and the file from the server. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with using AJAX and jQuery and templating, it's, it's really straightforward. Um, so what I do want to talk about is what happens once we get that page. Once, once I get the template and, and the content from the server, I render them together, what am I going to do with them inside of this method? Um, so <laughs> one thing that's kind of weird is I, I actually have to scroll back to the top of something that I didn't realize um, at first, but uh, apparently jQuery mobile will keep your scroll position at every transition. So um, so as to make sure, I guess, if you've scrolled all the way down a page and you go to another page, you're at the same place. I'm not quite sure why they do that, but I have to have that to scroll myself back to the top. Um, the next part is the part where we actually send the page back to jQuery mobile. So all mobile is here is just one of my many instances where I just cache things. I cache jQuery.mobile as the word mobile. Um, and I'm just calling the change page function, which is a global jQuery mobile method, uh, passing in the page content that we got from our server and any generated options we had. And what that is going to do is trigger the page before change event with a non-string location. And that'll allow jQuery mobile now to change to our slide. So I've completely, at this point, change slides without jQuery mobile actually um, calling any type of server, which is its natural type of inclination. Um, that can be a very performant thing. 
especially if the template's in memory. All you're going to be loading is the content. Um, the next thing I do is I go to the step. So if you've probably noticed the page is jumping around and things are showing up and going away, th those are steps in a slide. And I, I have to go to the correct step as well. So that happens after we navigate. And then finally, um, for uh, the last two parts here, the trigger and um, the sync, have to do with syncing and with um, a public API for Tassion. So um, those I'll talk a lot about um, at the end, but um, I have to do those here because the driver, um, you know, will only know about this state for, for the duration of this update function. Um, and this, uh, the, the trigger will be for anyone who's actually building upon uh, Tassion. Um, okay. Uh, so before I move on to like this syncing and the API stuff, um, let's talk about what I mean by the actual content. Um, I didn't come up with a lot of how this looks. A lot of it is just kind of enforced upon me by jQuery Mobile. Um, it's not the worst thing in the world. A lot of it kind of makes sense, um, but some of it is probably not the most accessible. Um, anyway, uh, let's let's see what it looks like. So. This, this template is, is, is basically just a HTML file with some curly replace spots in it, like here, content or index or count. I made up that word, by the way, curly replace spot, because I don't know what these are called. But uh, as it were, you, you should define these things so that they work with jQuery mobile. And the way you do that is you give the top level element a data role of page. And so every slide will be a page. Um, you define your assets. Um, the savvy observer may notice that these are not script tags, but they are links like the style sheets. Um, that is because for whatever odd reason, when this content is loaded by jQuery mobile, it can't parse the HTML or it breaks parsing. Um, so this was my workaround. Uh, if anyone has any you know input on that or why it happens? I'd be more than it would be well received at least. Um, I, to ensure that I have a similar header and footer at the bottom, so I hid the footer. Let me show it. There it is. Um, to ensure that those are the same, I define those here with the um, header. So you need a data role of header um, and a data ID of header and a data position fixed. All these things ensure that the header stays in the same place. Um, some may say it's overkill. I, I don't know. I, I don't want to think about the logic of how to do that on 28 mobile devices. Um, so I'll play nice with them. The other thing to notice is the sync control. So this is a Tassion specific jQuery mobile control. Um, you can add them anywhere on the page. I liked it on the header. Um, this is what you can use to toggle syncing. So right now you would not be receiving my commands and here you would. Um, for passengers, uh, you guys listening along, it, it would have a different effect. You would either ignore my commands or you would, um, or you would be listening and following along. Uh, when you are following along, you can't control the presentation. Um, and I think that's it basically for the template. Let's, let's take a look now at what the content of a slide might look like as well. So once again, you're going to need a data role of content. That's just another jQuery mobile-ism. Um, this is going to be the stuff that gets swapped out in the uh, content curly spot of, uh, of uh, the template. Um, just like the template, you can define assets for individual slides. So this is pretty nice. I, I like the fact that I can build a slide um, and I can have JavaScript that's used amongst all of them and I can have JavaScript that's used for some. Um, I can have CSS that's used for some. It ensures that I'm not loading one big monolithic style sheet for the entire presentation, because on mobile, obviously, that's important not to over, overdo anything and to only load what you need. So the only obvious way in my mind to do that is to just modularize um, your assets on a per slide basis. Uh, this particular content is the Mega Man slide, actually, and you can see the um, the input ID, uh, or the, rather the input and the uh, button down there, those things all turned into uh, jQuery mobile controls. So I didn't even have to write any code to have those look the way they did, um, other than the markup 
to tell jQuery Mobile to do that. So the other important thing about, um, about these uh, content files is that there's parts to them. Um, not all slides are just like one thing and you move on. Um, I, I know that the keynote slides are like that, but if you maybe want a more interactive experience, um, perhaps it may help to have steps in your slide. So that's what these are. Um, they allow for multi-part uh, sequencing in every slide. Uh, to define a step, all you have to do is add a data attribute um, to your individual slide. So what that means is you, you just add data-step and the number of the step in the sequence. So one will be the first click or first action in a direction um, on a slide. So if I were to hit back, that step would go away. If I hit forward, the step shows up. Um, now, in particular, these steps can be styled however you like. Um, and the reason for that is because uh, Tassion by itself doesn't actually do anything except add a class of active to the step. It's left completely up to the implementer to make these things uh, show up or go away however they like. One thing I did add, though, is inside the Tassion CSS file is some default steps to allow you to, um, to allow you to, like, for instance, fade stuff in and out. That's the, uh, the one I've been using throughout this presentation. Um, okay. So now that we have the uh, content figured out, um, let's go back to the syncing problem. Um, Assuming one ops into syncing, then for every step on every slide, Tassion needs to keep everyone in sync. That's a really important problem and one that took me a while to find something that was good enough to even work. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know, by show of hands, have any of your devices actually been following along with the presentation? Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> one. Um, so it's done by broadcasting my commands to the devices in your hands. Um, I use the metaphor of a driver and a passenger. It makes sense in my mind. Um, but uh, y if you hear those things, you'll know where they come from. Uh, you, you know, I call them a pres presenter in the audience or however, you know, works easier in your mind. Um, to make it possible, I use Pusher. So I, I'm not sure if you guys are, uh, know about Pusher, um, but I didn't even have to upgrade an account or anything. I'm still working on their free usage limits and it's, it seemed to work fine uh, for, for most of my experimentation. Um, I really like them. They're a cool group of guys, and they made it really easy to integrate. Um, but because at their core they're a paid service, um, it is an optional feature of Tassion. You don't need to have syncing in your presentation. Um, and I do plan on adding uh, optional support for different transport layers for doing um, real-time communication. Um, for the sake of this uh, presentation, I wanted something that was already tested by another team and would be production ready by the time I needed to demo it. So this will be the longest function I talk about. Um, this is choosing the right channel. Um, quite unsurprisingly, um, there's security risks and other things related to running a real-time service, making sure that the person with the right permission is controlling the right devices and not the other way around. So if you recall the open socket method from one of my earlier slides, um, you can see here what it does. So I'll talk a little bit about these. Um, before I do that, though, let me actually take a step back. All these methods I've been showing you are inside of tassion.js. It's a single JavaScript file, and these are all just private methods inside of the JavaScript file. Um, the, the path we've been taking is top down, a little jumping around, but for the most part, um, these things are freely viewable in the source. The comments you're looking at are actually, and, and, and all of the source code is being pulled from the Tassion JS file. So if I were to change it, you would see the change here. Um, but I just want you to know that, that if, if you're able to follow along with this, um, navigating the source code should be easy as well. Um, so what's happening here is um, I'm setting the sync mode to off, and I'm disabling syncing pessimistically. I just kind of assume that your device will not work. Um, the next thing I do is I look in the manifest that you've provided, or you being the implementer, and I see, has an API key been passed in? If it has, then that implies that whoever is doing this presentation 
wants syncing, whether he be the driver or the passenger, he wants that to happen. Um, so to, to figure out who's who, I have um, two inline functions I made, or rather these are the functions I'll call once I figure them out. Um, the first one is if you're a syncing passenger, in other words, you have an API key for a sync channel and, um, and you happen not to be the driver, then I'll call this series of uh, uh, method calls. First, I'll create a socket object. Um, that's just part of the pusher client library. If you recall from my first slide, um, loading in the pusher library allowed, allows me access to that class. Um, I add a socket listener to the connection. So if any of you actually connected and then the connection failed, um, what will happen is you'll see like an alert, um, which I define in my slide template files. Um, and those, those, uh, this method here will be the thing that, that links into those. Um, if you define a template without an alert, then you'll just see a native alert. So on an iPhone, you'll see the uh, pop-up. Um, and then finally, I mark you as a passenger. Um, and I'll walk in, uh, into passenger mode, uh, that, that method, uh, right after this slide. The other option is that you are a driver. Um, and in that case, um, I'm going to mark the server. Um, and I'm going to turn on syncing because a driver is always going to be sending messages and you can, he can shut it off if he wants, but that's there. And then finally, I mark the user as a driver. So this is where I actually figure out who's who. Um, if a server is actually defined in the manifest, I, it has to pass two more tests. It has to actually respond. So that's what this get JSON is. I'm just making a call directly to the server, a get request. Um, and if it doesn't respond, um, then I put you into passenger mode. If it does respond, but the API key it responds with doesn't match the API key in my manifest, then I know it's uh, not my server. Or at least maybe there's a bug in the way I turned my server on. Um, in which case, um, I would also go to passenger mode. Only after passing both those tests are you then marked as a driver. Um, so I think it's pretty secure, especially if you're on a closed network. Um, but even so, uh, it's more than I think most people would care to, <laughs> to mess up in a presentation. So um, that's, that's how I'm determining that I'm the driver right now. Um, you'll also know if you're the driver because you can navigate around while you're in sync mode, whereas passengers cannot. Um, the, uh, the other thing is I'll just mark you as a passenger with n no syncing enabled if you don't provide an API key. Um, so let's look at what that passenger mode function actually does, marking you as a passenger. Um, so those are the, the, the body element that I cached um, earlier. I'm now adding a class to it, um, uh, passenger. I'm also marking, uh, uh, caching my current role um, for use in other functions. Um, I'm removing a driver class in case, uh, you know, uh, this user was marked as a driver previously. And then I'm adding a socket listener for the sync um, message. So that's the channel. Um, by default, Tassion builds this type of communication for you. Um, and if you use Pusher, creating a channel by name implicitly totally works. So that's what's happening there. Um, finally, depending on whether you've clicked the little sync switch or not, I let you control the presentation. So toggle controller is just a method that has, um, has a few uh, listeners in it, or rather it, it sets listeners for touch or keyboard events, um, and that'll just toggle it on and off. Um, the driver method is, is quite similar as well. Um, we can go into that. So uh, in driver mode, same deal. You set your class to driver, set your body, uh, or remove the passenger class, and then toggle the controller on. The driver can always control the presentation. Um, these classes are important too, and they're important because if you think about a new way to present and you think about the fact that people could be looking at this on their mobile device while you're presenting, um, you can very easily imagine a scenario where you have something on your screen but something different on their screen. So it's almost like a, um, a virtual experience for them or a value added experience. Um, and that's kind of what I was trying to do. Unfortunately, I already passed through the slide where I did that. I forgot to mention it, but uh, the slide where I was waiting for the passengers, it said, um, waiting for passengers, and it should have said, welcome to Tassion or Spain.js on your phones. Um, so I apologize <laughs> for not mentioning that earlier. Um, 
Finally, I, I've talked a lot about this notion of a server. I haven't really mentioned what it is. Um, I don't like the fact that I package the server with Tassion. It's in the same repository, but it's something I built because I needed to, and there was no way to do client-side events, uh, safely at least. Um, but all it really is is a Node.js app that runs uh, off of the Node Pusher library. Um, it's a client library written by Jaywon Kim. Um, it allows you to just talk to Pusher's client API. Um, once, you, once you install um, the Node Pusher client library, uh, running the server is as easy as just calling Tassion.js through Node with uh, parameters that you would receive when you create a Pusher account. Um, I wanted to do something a little bit more um, client driven, so almost like people would write client libraries for the server, so you weren't just bound to using Node as your backend if you wanted to do this type of driver syncing. But for now, uh, it's, it's the option I provided, and you can find it inside of the uh, source tree for Tassion. And let's see what else I have here for you. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to talk about uh, when building a jQuery mobile app in general, but this is true for Tassion as well, is an API. Um, I want people to use this, and uh, I want to make it easy for people to use it, so I built an API. Um, it's not a very big API, but it's enough to get started, and hopefully with enough feedback, I can grow it to something even cooler. Um, so this is the API right now. Um, there's a Tassion object on, on the window, and you're able to make alerts, um, change to a specific slide, uh, move to the next and previous slide, bind listeners to specific Tassion events, um, and show the little spinner. Um, and th those seem basic enough. Uh, they, were, uh, they were built out of a need. Uh, like I said, this is actually an app built on top of Tassion. So I've implemented this API, and I can show you how I did that. Um, this method here, check for code, is actually an, an implementation of the Tassion API for this presentation. Um, to, to make all of these code blocks highlighted, I used a library called HighlightJS. You may have noticed it in the, um, in the template file. Um, and I listen at the very bottom here to the update event that Tassion fires whenever a new slide is generated. Um, I then check the code, map all of the code to um, the highlighter, and then mark the code as highlighted. And you can see I even apply a spinner using the Tassion API there while the code is loading. So the end effect would be a new slide is hit, the update method is called, um, the spinners go on, and the, all of the code is highlighted. Um, so it's a logical and necessary extension of the API I needed for this presentation. But uh, I ate my own dog food here, so hopefully it, it shows that it, it is viable, um, at least for, for this application. Okay, um, so that went really, really quick. Um, but in summary, uh, we initialized Tassion with a manifest file. So we wanted, to, we wanted to pass information into Tassion about a presentation. Manifest file is what I opted to use. Um, we subverted jQuery Mobile's default logic and injected our own slides. So jQuery Mobile gives us a lot of things, but it also takes a lot of things away from us. So we wanted to avoid those bad things by kind of loading in our own content. Um, we opened up a sync channel. Um, and I was marked as a driver. You all were marked as passengers. Um, and we exposed a public API and implemented it for this presentation. So. That's it. You have any questions? Questions? <laughs>